Hello from the heartland. My name is Jenna, and this is Smarter News. News when it matters and why it matters. Our Smarter series features unique people who help us think and live smarter. Richard, have you ever thought of how many photos you've taken over the course of your career? How many would you estimate? Wow. Well, it's been 51 years with the AP. And uh, many years before that, I was worked for two newspapers in the Los Angeles area prior to that. So it's, I don't even want to think about how many pictures <laughs> that is. What about just an event? Like if you went out to take a pictures of an event, mm -hmm. how, how many photos would you come home with from that event typically? Today, for example, I was at the, I'm at the New York Stock Exchange and I was on the trading floor. And I walked around and I picked pictures of people, you know, that the traders doing their thing and the opening bell. And then I come back and, and I sit down and, and out of my pictures that I took maybe 40 or more frames. Oh, I guess that'd be more than that. Maybe 50 frames. I have two cameras. So I had two different lenses and then I edited it down to transmit it for the AP, uh, eight photos out of that. I edited okay. it down. Mm -hmm. So that gives us an idea. Context is everything, as you know, as yeah, a journalist. Sure. Just so I give you a proper introduction, Richard Drew is a photojournalist with the Associated Press, the AP, and we met in an unexpected way and a really special way to me, Richard. So this is like interviewing a friend or maybe even a family member, which oh, we'll explain in you. just a moment. Like <laughs> I, I, I feel that way about you. And a few years after we met, I actually learned something very unexpected about you that I didn't know when we first said hello. And that is that you took one of the most profound historical photos of the September 11th terrorist attacks. And we're going to talk a little bit about that today too. So let's just lead our audience through this. First things okay. first, let's start with just the basics. Why did you become a photographer or a photojournalist? And we'll explain the difference in a moment. Well, um, I was, uh, when I was growing up, I was uh, always had, a, always sort of had a camera. And one Christmas, my parents gave me a, a 35 millimeter camera, a Yashica Lynx. I remember that. I still have it somewhere. I went looking for it the other day and I couldn't find it, but I know I have it. And I just happened to have it in my car one day when I was driving to school when I was uh, in college. And I was driving down the road and I came around the corner and there was a uh, a street sweeper had overturned and uh, on its side and there was a, and the driver was trapped inside. And uh, I was there when the police, the firefighters were there. And so I went over and took pictures of my camera. And by the time the local photographer from the newspaper came by and he was already extracted from there. So uh, he said to me, now this is in the middle sixties. So uh, he said, uh, ask me if I have pictures. I said, well, I'd like to sell them to the newspaper. I said, sure. He said, what, I said, what do you pay? He said, well, I'll give you $5 for the photograph or, or we'll put your name under the picture. And of course you'll get a, I'll, I'll give you a, a, a roll of film. Well, that was pretty smart to, with the new roll of film because you'll be ready when the next time something happens. And then I said, well, and I'll have my name in the newspaper. I said, well, that's, that's, a, that's a pretty cool thing. So I went ahead and did that. And that's how my career started. And it eventually it turned into having a, a police scanner, you could listen to police calls and I would you know, go listen for fire calls or a car accidents or something like that. And it, I worked my way into a summer internship with that newspaper. And that led to a staff position at a competing newspaper in another town. That's amazing. I, so mm -hmm. when, you were, when you were just sort of roving around listening to police scanners, were you just sort of as an independent journalist, just trying mm -hmm. to kind of yeah i was just chase, uh, was chase just the story a, just a, just a freelance person and when i was at, of course i was at school and i signed up for uh, the yearbook course and so that got me into photography and learned there as well as going out as well i was a summer intern i was uh, what they used to call a copy boy at this newspaper uh where i sold my first picture and i also got to go out on assignments with uh, photographers and i got to learn the craft that way by watching them <laughs> So what would you say is the difference? Because obviously you like taking photos before. What, what's the difference between saying I'm a photographer versus saying I'm a photojournalist? A well, photojournalist is a nice uh, badge you can wear too. You know, it's, it's pretty cool. Um, 
guess uh, a photographer, you're, you can take pictures of anything, but a photojournalist is about news and features, and that's the kind of stuff that we do. Like tomorrow morning, I have to photograph a fashion show, Michael Kors fashion show at the Tavern on the Green. In Central Park. In and Central that's Park. ironic because uh, uh, about 20 years ago, you were also on assignment for a fashion show the morning of September 11th, if I remember correctly, as we've talked about over the years. Right. I want to I want to get to that in a, in a moment, but I remember distinctly, and you've met a lot of really interesting people <laughs> over the course of your career. I mean, that's sort of an interesting thing. Including you. Well, I was going to say, so it's not going to hurt my feelings, Richard, if you don't remember, but I do I remember at the moment that we met. Do you remember that moment? I, I do remember. I was asked to photograph the beginning of the first show of a new business network to compete with CNBC. And there was this young lady standing there. She was delivering a report. And afterwards, when you were off the air, I went up and asked you, uh, you had to have your name for the caption. So I wrote it down and and you, and you said, uh, and who do you work for? And I said, well, the Associated Press. She said, well, you said, well, my, uh, my grandfather used to work for the Associated Press. I, and I said, where? And you said, San Francisco. And I said, was his name Paul K. Lee? You said, yes, that's my grandfather. And that's the beginning of a beautiful friendship. That's exactly right. So this is just, you have to think about it as a chaotic scene. We're, we're launching this network. It's, kind of a mess in general. And no one really knows what they're supposed to do, or where anyone's going. And we do have some photographers in the studio. So while you're live on television at certain times, people are taking your photo, which is something I'm definitely not used to. And Richard has a great ability to be everywhere, but be subtle about it, <laughs> and which is true, Richard. It's really a great quality. And we started to have this conversation. I just couldn't believe the chances because my grandfather worked for the Associated Press for really his entire career, but he passed away before I was old enough to ask him any questions. Um, he, he wasn't well, and so I never really got to know him. And he's a little bit of a mythical figure for me, Richard, because he could be rather abrupt. As a child, you know, I'd walk into his house and he'd have all his newspapers stacked around him, all mm -hmm. these National Geographic magazines that he collected as well, and these stacks, and it's huge magnifying glass because he lost his sight. And he was always in a suit, always in a button up shirt, always in suspenders with a fedora on. And that's how he was in his living room. So I really know nothing about the way he was in the office, but I'd be curious what you could tell us because you worked with him. him. That was early 1970s when I was right. there in San Francisco. So I remember him as mostly as a copy editor you know, on the San Francisco Bureau. I'm sure he went yeah. out on assignments too, but uh, I just remember him that way. Yes, I believe he was in the bureau. I mean, he, he had at one point um, as a young man traveled overseas and, and was a war correspondent during World War II and, mm -hmm. and filed stories from overseas. But I don't know too much about his career in San Francisco, just that he loved journalism and he loved the news. Oh, and he, he, had a, he, was a, he was a true newsman. So we'll fast forward. So periodically I would see Richard around the studio. He, if Richard was in the studio, that meant someone famous was probably coming in that he was going to take photos of. It wasn't because of us. And I would usually, we would always have a conversation and, you know, talk about how he was doing or what sort of work we were doing. And that was always really nice because I was far from home and it was nice to see a familiar face. But a couple of years after we met, one of my producers came up to me and said, you know, Richard is the man that took the photo of the falling man. And I didn't know exactly what he was talking about. And I think it's a photo that many people will recognize from September 11th. And it's almost a photo, Richard, I hesitate even describing. We'll show it, of course, because there are parts of it that are, that are indescribable, which I think we can talk a little bit about. Let's go back to September 11th, 2001. So I was off on that Monday, September 10th, and Tuesday morning, I had the first fashion show of that fashion weekend. It was a maternity fashion show. Um, and I went backstage as I usually do at shows like I'll probably do tomorrow morning. Right. So I did my hair and makeup pictures and then I made my way out to the front, the front of the auditorium there where it was gonna happen. It was actually in a tent, huge tent. And um, I was talking with a CNN cameraman. We were just shooting, shooting the breeze and they were gonna show part of the show live because of, uh, because it was the first day of Fashion Week. So um, the cameraman uh, put his finger to his ear where he had his earphone because he was talking, he could hear uh, his control room. And he said, there's been an explosion at the World Trade Center. And I said, really? And he said, no, no, wait a minute. He said, a plane's hit the World Trade Center. 
And almost simultaneous to that, my photo editor called me, Barbara Wojcicki, and she said, I'll never forget this, very calmly, uh, a plane's at the World Trade Center, bag the fashion show, you have to go. Well, at that time, uh, Fashion Week was in Bryant Park, which is on 42nd Street and 6th Avenue. And I, um, I gathered my gear and I walked a block over to Times Square. And I figured that the best way to get there would be in the subway. I wouldn't be uh, caught up in traffic or anything. And I took the express subway train to Chamber Street, which is a stop just before the World Trade Center. And um, I came up the stairs and I saw both towers were on fire. I, I remember my first thought was, that's interesting that one plane could do that much damage to two towers. And uh, I photographed like yeah. debris in the streets. We were a few blocks north of the World Trade Center and there was stuff laying in the street that the FBI was already there and they were examining. I've shot pictures of it. Stealthily, I moved over to West Street here, which is for your, uh, for your listeners, said be it's, it's one of the major north-south thoroughfares here in, uh, in Manhattan. And I made my way over to the corner of West and Vesey Streets. And they were staging the ambulances there. And I sort of surveyed the scene and I realized that if they're going to bring injured people, they're going to be coming to me at where ambulances are. And I had a perfect view of both of the towers, like just, a, just a, a little ways north of the towers. What was going through your mind as you're sort of navigating your next shot? Because you were looking for a good position as, right. as I, a good photojournalist. Well, you're always doing, you're always looking on your periphery. You're always keeping an eye on what's going on, you know, because you're keeping a track of your own safety as well as not getting in the way of whatever's going on, hindering any rescue operation. And I was standing between an, a woman EMT and a New York City police officer, and we were sort of looking at the buildings and I was photographing whatever was going on. And, and, uh, and the New York City police officer said, uh, you know, I was here when the second plane, hit. that's the first time I heard there was a second plane. And I, he said, I think it was a 737. So then the woman EMT says, oh my gosh, look at that. And we sort of looked up and I caught a view of people coming down from the building, one after another, uh, on not all on the same side of the building, just different sides of the building. They were mostly from the North Tower, if I remember correctly. And uh, I just instantly picked up the camera and, and started photographing them as they came down. What did you think at that time? You're sort of on autopilot. You just, you think about this is part of the job and part of the, whatever's going on. And you just record history because that's what I do every day. I record history. What was the scene like around you? Were people, ta was there a lot of noise, distractions? Well, what, do you remember of, any of that? I remember, I remember that there was, it, it was, there was of course a lot of activity, you know, the sirens and the police and firemen running around and stuff like that. And then, and then uh, uh, I heard this sound of sound of like an avalanche, kind of a rock slide, not an avalanche, but like a rock slide and all that and down, down the side of a mountain or something. And uh, I then instinctively turned my camera uh, to my, to my right, which would be looking south. And <clears throat> I, I saw some debris coming down and I photographed the, so I was using a, a telephoto lens. So I was photographing the, the, what I thought was a part of the facade falling down. It was actually the collapse of the South Tower. And uh, I was photographing, I have a whole series of images of the South Tower collapsing. And uh, then all of a sudden this, I guess it was a, another EMT grabbed me and dragged me down the street. I guess that would be Bessie Street, dragged me down Bessie Street and said, we said, we have to get out of here. And he pulled me down the street. Otherwise I probably would have been, you know, buried in whatever debris would have come down the way. Because you were so close, you were yeah. so close to the actual scene. When did you take the photo of the falling man? Uh, that was before the collapse of the South Tower. I heard them, you could hear them hitting the like canopy that would come out. My goodness. Yeah. I just saw recently again, uh, some video by two French filmmakers who just by happenstance were traveling with a New York City fire, fire truck. I actually saw the plane fly over them and hit the building, the first plane. And then uh, he was with the fire crew and went right into the lobby of the building. And But they could hear the, the people falling also from inside. And I could hear it again. Just, it was, it's one of the, the moments. I mean, the day is so horrific in so many different ways, but thinking of falling that distance or choosing to jump that distance is, 
underscores the choices that people had to make. And I just can't imagine what it would be like to witness that. And what you, did you think at the time, Richard, that this is a terrorist attack? This is, uh, did you, did any of that register? How did you keep yourself calm enough? Well, I to guess keep my, what, photographing? One my, what, one of my first thoughts was, I guess when I was looking up at the buildings on fire is you know, they're never going to put this out with any fire truck or shooting water from the street. And right. I was just wondering how they're ever going to put this fire out, you know, to, and so just you're thinking about it logistically. So how did you even, did you just, is it just your experience that kept you composed it's enough just, to- tr- It is, it's just your instincts as, as, a, as a, you said, a photojournalist and not just a photographer or mm-hmm. a camera owner, as they say, right. as, as, as we like to call them. Which we, which we all are at this point with our phones. Oh, Actually, exactly. we, were, we were looking up, I, again, just thinking of context. And one of the facts that we stumbled upon is that there's nearly 2 billion images every day uploaded that are, you know, photographs, images around the world. I mean, that's just, there's just so many, that's more images than you could possibly ever imagine, you know? And so the fact that there's several salient in- images from this day that have so, that is so re- recorded um, really speaks to how profound this, this photograph is. So let's go back to the story. So you're dragged mm-hmm. back by this. I was dragged this- down the street and away from that. And then afterwards I was of course covered with the soot and all the the debris that was, you know, had been falling around. And I was wearing black like I am today, just, I guess. I mean, it was making pictures of all the debris and the, it was sort of like a, it was like this coating of ash and, and I don't know, powder, I don't know how to describe it, all over the street and everything. So it like, felt like you're walking in sort of snow kind of stuff on the ground. It was really something. And so I did some photos like that. And so how did you decide, okay, I'm done? I mean, it's clearly it was a historical event. You know yeah. this at this point. And it's of a magnitude that no one had ever seen. Mm-hmm. When did you stop taking photographs? When did you say, okay, I'm going to leave now and look well, at what I actually have? When I uh, put on a shorter focal length lens and I looked up at the still standing nor- uh, North Tower and I started taking pictures of it. And when I did that, it mushroomed out and it fell down. And I have a series of pictures of the North Tower falling. And I said, you know, I think it's time to get out of here. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, yeah. I, yeah, and then I walked back up West Street where they had set up uh, a makeshift sort of shower for people. And I photographed that so they could wash themselves off. And I walked over uh, as I was walking back to, uh, to Midtown near Rockefeller Center where the, uh, I, I passed by St. Vincent's Hospital where uh, outside they had all the nurses and doctors and stretchers were all outside. And, and the way this happened is you either survived or you didn't. And there weren't any people showing up there and all that. I remember having to walk back to the office because all the subways and everything, they're shut down, and which was in Midtown and Rockefeller Center at the time. And, and I was on standing on a corner and some guy looked at me and says, where have you been? I mean, like that I was had all this white stuff and all my clothes and everything were all covered in this soot and ash and stuff. Anyway, so I was- Just like I, a New Yorker, by the way, for some sort exactly. of comment like that. You're like, where have you been? It's really the where question. <laughs> like, what, that's so I made my way back to the office, walked up Sixth Avenue, I remember that, back to Rockefeller Center. And I went up to the fifth floor and where the AP office was in the Rockefeller Center in that building. And I put my ca- camera disc in my laptop and I started looking at pictures. And that's the first time I really got to see the, what I really had taken. You can't see it in the little screen at that time. We were, it was sort of an early version of a digital camera. It was, in, it was a professional digital camera. It was uh, sort of rudimentary in a way. And I started looking at the pictures and I came across uh, the picture which became Falling Man. And I called one of our senior photo editors over and I said, uh, I think this is the picture. And he said, yes. And so I cropped the picture, you know, made it, sized it and toned it as we normally do if I was in the dark room and pushed the button to send it. And I think this is important to note about the Associated Press. I, I received a question the other day from one of our audience members asking about the Associated Press. Mm-hmm. And and it's, it's really important to note, it's, it's, a, it's a, a very prestigious position to be part of the Associated Press. It's an international newswire service. Um, and w- what the Associated Press writes and the photographs that the photojournalist takes go all over the world. Right, Richard? I mean, it's, it's, right. it's we, such we, an... In- 
we don't have an agenda. We are we're a, we're a news cooperative, and I wish I still knew the numbers of how many subscribers we have, which are or what we call them members, because uh, it started out as a news cooperative where we don't have a photographer and say. Keokuk, Iowa, but if there's something important happens in Keokuk, Iowa, the paper there, we can call on them. If they take the Associated Press or they're a nearby newspaper, they will share the picture with the rest of the Associated Press members. And therefore, that so it's like a benefit for everyone. So it's, it's really important because the Associated Press mm-hmm. can provide the news wire for any big news story with some of the details that, for example, I wouldn't have if I wasn't in a place like New York City and also the photographs. So as you're looking through in that moment, Richard, what was it about that photo that you said of all these photos I've taken, and clearly there were a substantial amount of them, what was it about that one that you thought this is the one? Well, it, it, I'm, sure you're, you're, I'm sure your viewers will see it when I, after I describe it. It's, it has a, a symmetry about it. It's like this man is sort of bisecting the two World Trade Centers, and he's perfectly vertical with his uh, leg bent, and he's like heading straight down. Well, that's sort of, I, I've also said that I didn't take the picture at that moment. I didn't push the button when he was in that position. I, uh, our cameras uh, have, we used to call it, have a motor drive or it can shoot a sequence of photographs. And so, I held my finger on, when the people were falling, I hold my finger on the button and the camera keeps taking pictures until I take my finger off the button. So the camera happened to cycle at that very moment where he was in this position. If it was a fraction of a second this way or a fraction of a second this way, he wouldn't, we wouldn't have had the same impact. It wouldn't have the same symmetry and it probably would have become falling math. Mm-hmm. How soon after you you distributed the photo mm. did you realize that some thought it was a very significant photo and some thought it was almost too raw or controversial to publish? When did you first sense the 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 split? Because there's been some debate over the years and you've talked about this, which yeah. did well, you even expect that when you when you put that forward, put the photo the, forward? At the beginning of the photo caption. At that time, and still, to, and still to this day, the Associated Press will put at the beginning of the caption caution uh, graphic content at, at the you know for the to warn the editors or who's ever going to read the paper you know look at the caption and decide whether they're going to use the photograph. Uh, that's the thing about the AP and and or any news organization that sends pictures out, whether it be my competition or the AP. It's up to the individual newspaper, magazine, website. Mag, whoever it happens to be, who would use the picture, it's up to the editor of that newspaper, magazine, website to use that photo. If there's a, the paper in Allentown, Pennsylvania called the Allentown Call, the editor thought it was very important. He said it's a really significant picture, and they put it on the back page of their first section of the Allentown Call and found September 12th, and they got a lot of flack uh, about it. The editor, they, uh, I saw an interview with him, with the editor, and he said uh, that they got a lot of uh, angry letters about it and uh we said but the uh, papers like the new york times used the picture in color on september 12th and the staten island advance here in new york they they used the picture also as well as many other newspapers uh around the world i'm thinking back a few days ago i got some i got an email from somebody who didn't like the idea that i was ex- uh, exploitative or something like that about mm. using this photograph that's not your personality to, <laughs> to I've, it took me several years to find out that you even took this, this photograph and it's clearly moved people in, in a, in a very significant way. One of the things that you've said in the past is that you don't necessarily think about it as capturing someone's death, Mm-mm. that you actually think about it as capturing it's a part someone's of final. Life. Yeah. It's tell a, us it's about a part that. Of this person's life. Uh, this person either had to make a decision or the decision was made for him to exit the whatever floor he was on, upper floor of the World Trade Center. And it, for me, it, it's a very quiet photograph. There's no, there's no violence, a very quiet photo of a very violent thing, a very violent event. Um, there are like three other photographs that I think are, have been accepted that are pretty violent pictures. And the, all three are from the Associated Press. I, I'm gonna quote one is by, uh, it's been known as sort of as uh, the napalm girl, the young girl 
uh, running toward the camera after she was caught in a napalm attack because she's naked and she has she's crying and she was severely burned by the napalm. Now that picture has been used all over the world and over and over again and it won a Pulitzer Prize. Uh, another picture is another AP photo done in Vietnam by Eddie Adams. Uh, I believe it was the Saigon police chief shooting someone in the head on the street in Vietnam at the instant the gun the bullet entered this guy's head. And that was also a Pulitzer Prize picture. And then right here in the United States at Kent, Kent State University in Ohio, uh, the young lady kneeling next to the student who was shot by the, by the National Guard during an anti-war protest. Now, these are three pictures that have been accepted uh, uh, by readership around the world. And yet people go, oh my gosh, I can't look at the, you know, I don't want to see the falling man. And I think it's because it could be you or me. Mm -hmm. You think that it resonates with everyone, mm -hmm. that moment. Yeah. And now here we are, you know, 20 years later, as you're thinking about 20 years, first of all, it seems like a long time. It doesn't really seem that long ago, does it? No, I mean, it seems especially like it when went you... like that. Really yeah. yeah. What do you, is there any new observations or feelings this year about the photograph? Just considering also the news cycle and just sort of where we are as a country that you feel that feels different to you than, you know, a couple of years ago. Is there anything new hmm. about this for you? No, I feel it's still, it's still controversial. People still want to talk about it, even though people don't want to see it. It's pretty interesting. There's a real interest in it again. Last, last night I was just randomly on Instagram and I, I got this text, uh, several texts. And one of them was from the sister of who was tentatively identified as falling man. Somehow he got identified also as Jonathan Briley, who was a an AV tech, an audio visual technician at the windows in the world, at the top of the World Trade Center. And uh, I, randomly, I got a text from his sister last night on Instagram. She, she must have seen that I was on Instagram. And she said that she was going to be in at the ceremony here on Saturday uh, at the World Trade Center. And uh, that she would say a prayer for him, for me. Oh, which is pretty cool. That's amazing. That's amazing. I, I was just going to ask you that about whether or not they've ever gotten close, closer to identifying mm -hmm. who that person was. She, she looked at the photographs of, you know, I guess a picture of the falling man and she's compared them to pictures and she knows how tall he was approximately and how he used to dress, I would imagine. But that was really, that was really spooky last night when yeah. just randomly she reached out to me. Well, that's very moving too, that she, that's her, that's her reaction to mm -hmm. it, which is yeah. just as we're talking about the, the controversy over it, that the person whose brother it may be mm -hmm. had that to say, will okay. you be at ground zero um, at the 9-11 Memorial on September Actually, 11th, Richard? I've never worked at the coverage of the September 11th Memorial ever in the last 20 years. I've ha I had a, I have a supervisor. He always would schedule me off on September 11th or to do something else on September 11th then. And it's sort of stuck. And How do you feel about that? Is it is it okay with you that you're not working or is there a part of you that no, would like to work? That's fine. It's not that I don't like to work. It's just that it's okay that I'm not going to mm -hmm. there. I understand. Why do you think it's important that we still see the photo, that we don't look away from an image like this? I think it sh should be that we have to remember that there were people who died that day. It wasn't just two buildings falling at a big cloud of, you know, dust and, and papers and, and building debris. And then we've spent, I don't know how many years cleaning it up. There were actually people there. Apparently this week, they just identified two more of the deceased. Uh, the first time wow. since 2019 that they've, uh, they've been able through uh, DNA testing, they're using some new DNA testing and they were able to identify two more of the victims. And I think the, if I remember correctly, I heard this morning that the, both families have asked that they remain anonymous. Mm. Your photos also helped identify some people, haven't they, Richard? Even though oh, the falling yeah. man was not hundred percent confirmed. Right. There was what a, about yeah, there was a gentleman uh, I got a phone call one day from uh, a man who lived in New Jersey, and he said, uh, you know, uh, my fiance uh, was in the World Trade Center on that day, and I know what she was wearing, and, and if it's be all right with you, if, we could, if I could come and look at your photographs of the falling people, 
and uh, I could possibly get some closure out of this. And so he came and he sat at my desk and we looked at the, we go through it frame by frame. And he saw this picture of this woman who was falling sort of, or she was sort of in a V-shape falling down backwards, like her head and feet are like mm -hmm. this. She was falling like this. And he said, yeah, that's her. So I was able to give him closure that he was able to identify that one way or another, she didn't fall, die, I guess, when the buildings fell, but she chose or she fell from the building. What was that moment like to share with someone? Well, it was it was good for me because I'm glad I was able to help someone with my with my photography, and it wasn't just you know another picture of a falling person from the from the World Trade Center. Mm -hmm. How many people in all did you capture in photos? You know, I've never counted, mm -hmm. and that's something. In 20 years, I've never really gone back and counted how many of them were. Yeah, just gives us such perspective for those of us who weren't there that day. I know these, these questions are tough. And even sometimes when I'm asking them, you know, it, it is, it, it's such a, it's such evil to confront, you know, a terrorist attack. And we don't really describe it in that way, oh. as you mentioned sometimes. And it's interesting that the tradition has been for a lot of television networks to replay the broadcast as it was. And for those of us who weren't in New York city or weren't even stateside, there's something that you see differently every year that we see the coverage. It's still very difficult to sort of wrap your head around. I, I, you... I was actually, I was, I was actually listening to something the other night, but they said that uh, the, the commentator mentioned that at the beginning, they were showing some video of people falling. And then one of the news anchors said, no, 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 we're not going to show that anymore. And so they right. didn't show that. And then they thought it was exploitative that, that they would keep showing the buildings falling. So they actually didn't show much of the, the actual collapse. It was mostly just that cloud of debris yeah. and the people running away. So that was sort of edited for content where overseas, apparently they used pictures of the people falling. Um, I can actually and, attest to that. Yeah. I was overseas in Spain. I had just been there oh. a few days. I was in a college program and we had just flown through New York city and got into Spain and watched everything unfold live. The, the, mm. the time difference it was in the afternoon there. And I spent the next five months Mm -hmm. watching Spanish television. So when I came home, I really didn't know some of the stories that everybody knew because I didn't, I hadn't met the firefighter families. I didn't mm -hmm. know some of the names. I didn't know any of the stories. And what we were seeing on television in Spain was, was more graphic in a lot of ways than what was shown stateside. And, and I don't know if that's true of European television in general. This was my experience during breaking, breaking news, but I, I think that was one of the reasons I got interested in journalism. I always was interested in journalism, even yeah. as a little girl, but it was just a reminder that journalism is really powerful because it helps frame the stories that we're, we're telling each other. It's not just mm -hmm. about reporting a story. It's the stories that we're telling each other that are framing our lives. And that really matters. And I can also speak to how we edit the event. As I recall, the decisions in, in some of the broadcasts that I've been part of is that we only show the buildings falling once mm -hmm. and there's never any replaying of it. And that mm -hmm. was kind of a rule at the, at the time that I was working. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's a really interesting, healthy debate to have about whether or not that should be about how to be respectful and not be exploitative, but also not hide what happened. And That's it's interesting, part. right? You, you, you were, you were the photographer that was in place when Robert Kennedy was assassinated and you were taking some, I mean, the photos from that, which were extremely graphic and important, those photos you've mentioned have, were shared widely. And there wasn't this, there wasn't necessarily a debate about that, or maybe you can tell us better, Richard, because that's an, it's not, I'm not trying to compare the two events, No, no, no but, I understand. But, right. How we're framing our storytelling as journalists. I, I was one of four photographers that were in the kitchen when Robert Kennedy was shot. I was actually on the stage when he was giving his speech and now on to Chicago, the famous on the Chicago speech. And I left the stage early and he was supposed to go off stage the other way. And, and I went to the kitchen because it was an easy exit. The, the ballroom of the Ambassador Hotel, where the event was, was really crowded. It was like sardines in a can. And uh, we couldn't exit through the crowd. And so I went off to my left and down a little step, still little steps and into the kitchen. And I was really thirsty. I got a glass of water. And he would then walk by me and I put the glass down and I sort of followed right in behind him. 
and we were walking through the kitchen and a few steps later, Sirhan Sirhan came up and mm-hmm. allegedly shot Robert Kennedy. So I then climbed up on a, uh, there was like a, a, a stainless steel work table, myself and a UPI photographer climbed up on this table and where we could look directly down on where Robert Kennedy was being tended to. And, um, and I was able to photograph in there and take pictures and Ethel Kennedy came up and she was waving her hand in front of us and said, oh, don't, don't, please don't take any pictures. Don't take pictures. And that was her choice for me not to take a picture. That wasn't my, that wasn't my choice. And I was there to do my job again. And I had to remain calm again in those situations. And, and, but there was no hesitation about putting that picture on the front page of the newspaper where I worked for at that time. The past, they put the picture on the front page. Life Magazine used the picture of the LA Times, UPI, and the Pasadena paper where I worked at the time before I joined the AP. Um, we all used the picture and there was no outcry. There was no, how could you use this picture thing? It just didn't happen. I think that's so interesting. Mm-hmm. I think it's so interesting to think about that. So what do you think the difference is, Richard? Is it just a, you know, editorial tastes have changed? Are we trying to shield ourselves away from evil? We, we, we could probably take it in any number of, of directions. What do you think is, I is the reason? Un- I still don't understand why my photograph uh, uh, that doesn't have any, any violence in it at all. And like I said before, a very quiet picture. This, this person, he has all his arms and legs and he's not hitting the ground. He's not laying in a big splat of blood or something. And don't, don't want to use this picture, although it ha- has been used. You know, the photograph of uh, Robert Kennedy being, it does have all those things, as you mentioned. Mm-hmm. It does have blood. It is graphic. It is violent. It's all those things. And so, so do you think the difference is still the fact that people can imagine themselves as the falling man where they don't necessarily imagine themselves as a, as a politician that can be targeted? Being, being killed, I guess. Well, we also saw the video of his brother being killed uh, right. just a few years earlier, 1963. So, so do you think it's just a diff- there's just something different about your photo that uh, I don't know where the where the criteria, where the, I don't know where that line is. I haven't figured out where that line is. I think that's a really great thing to ask our audience. I think, because I think everyone has a strong feeling when they see the photo. So I'll be curious with what they think about that. Just a couple of final questions for you, Richard. You know, obviously you found yourself in these situations, witnessing history up close. Do you think that's just a coincidence? Do you just think that you wound up in the one place just, just by happenstance or do you think it's something else? Uh, it's interesting you bring that up. I was, uh, there's an actual video on YouTube that I had to show somebody recently. They didn't believe it, that uh, someone in, in Los Angeles, I did some research to find out who this person was. Uh, this person has taken the, the events of uh, the RFK assassination, September 11th, um, tarot cards and numerology and did this investigation and figured out that I'm a member of the Illuminati. Wait, come on, Richard. <laughs> that I had foreknowledge of these events. So I'm just guessing that you're not a member of the Illuminati. Well, I, I, I couldn't tell you if I was. You would never confirm. Okay, I would never so, confirm what do you, so what do you, you do reflect on this and you look over the course of your career and you think to yourself, look at all these coincidences, look at all this time that I've been able to be in these historic moments. What do you think? Well, what do you but, think? Of but a lot that? of times I get assigned to these his, not historic moments. Well, of these, course, of course. Events. All right. Of okay. course. So here, here, here's another one. One of my colleagues asked me today about something about this article that you were mentioned earlier in the month with, about the Miami Herald. Um, I was assigned to a, uh, a baseball tournament in the Dominican Republic in 1996. I actually looked it up today to figure out what year it was. And I got a call at two o'clock in the morning in the hotel. And they said, uh, oh, I like your cup, by the way. Thank you. I'll send you one, Richard. Oh, <laughs> uh, so uh, anyway, I was going to say, so I was there and I was just got to call it one or two in the morning. And they said, there's a, a plane, uh, 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 an, an, an airliner uh, with full of German tourists had crashed in the Caribbean on the other side of the island. And so I grabbed my gear and I, this is back in film days, of course. And I, uh, myself and a reporter, who was also there uh, for this baseball tournament. We got a car and a car and a driver that took us to the other side of the island. And I was there to photograph them bringing in the bodies of the there because they had been floating in the Caribbean. Now there wasn't like this big naval or, you know, Coast Guard patrol boats bringing these people in. 
they were all on these private boats, people's boats that were had gone out and to collect the bodies. And they were just laid out on the decks of the boats. And I was standing on a pier photographing this going on. And uh, this is one of the times when I've had to, when the camera filter didn't work for me, uh, camera as a filter. Uh, I'm a father of four kids. That's great. And uh, there was, uh, there was, I just saw the picture again today. There was a, uh, the, one of the people that was putting, once they came to the, sh came to the shore, came to the pier, they were then being put into body bags. And uh, one of the people on the boat was picked up this small child by his, by his legs and his or her legs and put them in this body bag. It was a very small child. And uh, that's the time when I said, uh, I'm going to have to step aside for a few moments here. And I just went around behind this refrigerator truck that they were then putting the bodies into. And I just sort of composed myself and went back and shot more, shot more photographs. But uh, that's some of the stuff I have to do. Mm -hmm. And that's part of being a photojournalist. Yes, it, is, it isn't yeah. all just it isn't all just fashion shows like tomorrow oh, fashion shows right like, like tomorrow like back to fashion shows like tomorrow morning back to my, the diversity of what you've done is is mm -hmm. is also incredible i know you feel very passionately about journalism which is something that i love about you because it's important that that we remain strong as a yes, tribe right. that those yes. dedicated to journalism you know what I hope as a journalist is that my work matters, you know, that I'm actually providing a service that at the end of the day, I can look at my work and think I've actually not necessarily made someone's life better, but I've been, I've improved the storytelling. I'm, I'm honoring the facts and that, that I've made a difference in some way. And the falling man to me is, is so obviously does that Richard, you know, and mm -hmm. I wonder with your, with your career, do you look at it when you can look at some of these photos that are so iconic and still evoke such meaning? Do you feel like you've accomplished that in your career that you've you've made that difference? That I, I, I like to think that I, I have a privilege that people don't have, that the average person who's going to pick up the New York Times tomorrow and the subscriber there, he, he or she doesn't have, that I have a privilege of, of being at these events. Photography is a creative tool for I have a privilege to be able to share that moment in history with those people, whether it be at the fashion show or 9-11 or the presidential campaign or wherever it happens to be, if I'm covering a Yankee game or some press conference at City Hall or something that happens to just happens to be a newsworthy event that I'm assigned to, that I'm able to share that with um, the reader. And I feel that that gives me a feeling of accomplishment that I was able to do to share something with somebody else. And also, I, I like to know that if my competition was there and I see my picture, say, in the, again, if I see my picture in the New York Times or the Daily News or the Post, even if they had their own staff photographer there and they chose mine, that, my, that I did my job a little bit better. Mm -hmm. And that's what I try to do every day. I, I, look, I, I get up and I try, I don't want to look at my job every day the same way. I can come to the New York Stock Exchange, like I've been, like where I'm actually work, talking to you from now. And I can, I can come here and I have to look at it a different way and look for different things every time I come here. Mm -hmm. So if we're looking at the picture of the falling man now, 20 years later, what would you like us to consider as we're looking at it? Hmm. That's, it's a, it's an interesting question. How would I would be considered? I'd like people to accept it and to look at it and to think that maybe it could be you or me and that if they want to put themselves in that, think it could be them, then it has a meaning for them too, as well as it not just a picture of the falling man. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to think about that as we move farther from the date, but the, the photo remains the same. And that's one of the amazing things about photography that I know I've experienced looking at it and my kids will experience looking at it in generations to come. Well, if you have the falling man, He's there. You can turn the page, but he's still going to be on that page. You know, you turn the page in the newspaper, he's still going to be there for the next time you open that page, open that book, whatever you look on that web page, he's going to be there. It isn't like a fleeting image, like a video image or a film image, you know, like a motion picture image. Uh, so I think that that's another reason why uh, it's had such resonance over the, over the years is because it's there and it's not something that, I, I, I notice a lot of television news, uh, network news, CNN, CBS, people like that, they're using more and more still images now. And I think that's very important. Yeah. 
I, I think it's important too. It brings us back to letting us take a little more time. Exactly, because they'll have it on the screen and then it'll still be there while the guy's talking and, or the woman's talking and then, it'll, and then it'll go to another still picture maybe of something else that happened in that same, of that same event. It's interesting. We're going from some of the rapid fire coverage to okay. once again, maybe revisiting a little bit more of the, of a, of a slower pace, which is something we're trying to do with smarter news too. higher quality, smaller bites, maybe taking a little more time and taking time to talk, do one interview about one image too. Although it's been a lot more than that. Okay. Richard, it's really been a pleasure. I'm so glad that we were able to do this. I'm really glad to see you again. Quick, concise, nonpartisan, smarter news, a refuge from the storm. I'm Jenna. Thank you for choosing smarter.